It's a sultry night in July. You've fallen asleep in the armchair. Abruptly, you startle awake, disoriented. The television set is on, but not the sound. You strain to understand what you're seeing. Two ghostly white figures in coveralls and helmets are softly dancing under a pitch-black sky. They make strange little skipping motions, which propel them upward amid barely perceptible clouds of dust. But something's wrong. They take too long to come down. Encumbered as they are, they seem to be flying. A little. You rub your eyes, but the dreamlike tableau persists. Of all the events surrounding Apollo 11's landing on the moon on July 20th, 1969, my most vivid recollection is its unreal quality. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin shuffled along the gray, dusty lunar surface, the earth looming large in their sky, while Michael Collins, now the moon's own moon, orbited above them in lonely vigil. Yes, it was an astonishing technological achievement and a triumph for the United States. Yes, the astronauts displayed death-defying courage. Yes, as Armstrong said as he first alighted, this was a historic step for the human species. But if you turned off the byplay between mission control and the Sea of Tranquility, with its deliberately mundane and routine chatter, and stared into that black-and-white television monitor, you could glimpse that we humans had entered the realm of myth and legend. We knew the moon from our earliest days. It was there when our ancestors descended from the trees into the savannas, when we learned to walk upright, when we first devised stone tools, when we domesticated fire, when we invented agriculture and built cities and set out to subdue the earth. Folklore and popular songs celebrate a mysterious connection between the moon and love. The word month and the second day of the week are both named after the moon. It's waxing and waning from crescent to full to crescent to new was widely understood as a celestial metaphor of death and rebirth. It was connected with the ovulation cycle of women, which has nearly the same period, as the word menstruation, the Latin mensis means month, ultimately from the word to measure, as the word menstruation reminds us. Those who sleep in moonlight go mad, the story went. And the connection is preserved in the English word lunatic. In the old Persian story of vizier, renowned for his wisdom, is asked which is more useful, the sun or the moon? The moon, he answers, because the sun shines in daytime, when it's light out anyway. Especially when we lived out of doors, it was a major, if oddly intangible presence in our lives. The moon was a metaphor for the unattainable. You might as well ask for the moon, they used to say, or you can no more do that than fly to the moon. For most of our history, we had no idea what it was. A spirit, a god, a thing. It didn't look like something big far away but more like something small nearby, something the size of a plate, maybe, hanging in the sky a little above our heads. Ancient Greek philosophers debated the proposition that the moon is exactly as large as it looks, close quote, betraying a hopeless confusion between linear and angular size. Walking on the moon would have seemed a screwball idea, it made more sense to imagine somehow climbing up into the sky on a, a ladder or on the back of a giant bird, grabbing the moon and bringing it down to earth. 
nobody ever succeeded, although there were myths aplenty about heroes who had tried. Not until a few centuries ago did the idea of the moon as a place a quarter million miles away gain wide currency. And in that brief flicker of time, we've gone from the earliest steps in understanding the moon's nature to walking and joyriding on its surface. We calculated how objects move in space, liquefied oxygen from the air, invented big rockets, telemetry, reliable electronics, inertial guidance, and much else. And then we sailed out into the sky. I was lucky enough to be involved in the Apollo program, but I don't blame people who think the whole thing was faked in a Hollywood movie studio. In the late Roman Empire, pagan philosophers had attacked Christian doctrine on the ascension to heaven of the body of Christ and on the promised bodily resurrection of the dead, for the good reason that the force of gravity pulls down all earthly bodies. St. Augustine rejoined in these words, If human skill can by some contrivance fabricate vessels that float out of metals which sink, how much more credible is it that God, by some hidden mode of operation, should even more certainly effect that these earthly masses be emancipated from the chains that bind them to earth? That humans should one day discover such a mode of operation was beyond imagining. Fifteen hundred years later, we emancipated ourselves. The achievement elicited an amalgam of awe and concern. Some remembered the story of the Tower of Babel. Some Orthodox Muslims among them felt that setting foot on the moon's surface was impudence and sacrilege. Many greeted it as a turning point in history. The moon is no longer unattainable. A dozen humans, all Americans, have made those odd, bounding motions they called moonwalks on the crunchy, cratered, ancient gray lava beginning on that July day in 1969. But since 1972, no one from any nation has ventured back. Indeed, none of us has gone anywhere since the glory days of Apollo, except into low Earth orbit. Like a toddler who takes a few tentative steps outward and then breathless retreats to the safety of his mother's skirts. <laughs> 